I think you're really going to enjoy this, so give it up for Dr. Dave Schramm. Test, test. All right, this is on. Woo! I am so excited to be here today. So my name is Dr. Dave. Let me give you a little bit of background about how, how I came about that. So I graduated from Auburn University, War Eagle. Yes, okay, somewhere back there. And then I went to University of Missouri. So, okay, there they are. There. And my first semester teaching at Mizzou, I was in this class, teaching a class of about 240 students or so. And about midway through the semester, I came home and I said, honey, it's so funny that the students, they call me Dr. Dave. And our daughter, four-year-old daughter, she just starts to giggle. I said, what's so funny, Mallory? And she says, dad, you're not a doctor. I said, actually, Mallory, I've been to 10 years of school and I'm trying to convince this four-year-old that I'm a doctor. And she looks at me and she says, dad, you're not a doctor. You don't help anybody. <laughs> Sweetheart, let me help you to room, right? Let me help you. So I'm not that kind of doc, apparently not the kind of doctor that helps people, but I really do. I try to, to travel and train and talk about parenting and happiness and relationships, really what life is, is all about. I've worked with Head Start in Utah and Missouri and, and Oregon and presented in Nebraska recently about this important topic of happiness. First, anybody here from Minnesota by chance? Any Minnesotans? No. Wisconsin? Yeah, okay, yes, we have some... How cold is it right now? Up North Dakota, any of those? Is it stinking cold? Yeah, so okay. So this is, this is Harold and Marge. Harold and Marge, they live in Minnesota, and they decide, you know what? It is stinking cold. It's February. Let's go down to Orlando, where we celebrate our honeymoon 50 years earlier. So they decide to, they get their tickets, but it turns out that Marge has to fly down a day later than Harold. So Harold, he books his ticket. He arrives a day early. He checks into his nice hotel. He says, oh, I'm going to send my wife an email. So he gets on, sends his wife an email. Without realizing, he sends the email, but misspells her email address by one letter. He's one letter off. Meanwhile, in Houston, in Houston, there's a widow. A widow, she comes home from her husband's funeral. Her husband is a pastor at the local church. She comes home expecting messages from family members and loved ones, and upon reading the first email, she screams, she faints, passes out, her son comes rushing into the room, looks at the screen, and it says in the subject line, I've arrived. <laughs> it says, hello, honey, I know you're surprised to hear from me. They have computers here now, and you're allowed to send emails to your loved ones. I've just arrived, I've been checked in, I see that everything has been prepared for your arrival tomorrow. <laughs> Look forward to seeing you then. Hope your journey is as uneventful as mine was. P.S. It's much hotter than I thought down here. Be prepared, honey. Be prepared. It's stinking hot down here. Now, how many of you have done that? Raise your hand if you've been guilty. You sent a text message and you auto-correct it into something else. And yeah, you sent that. And that you wish you could just hit that retract button, right, that they haven't invented yet. I think it's important. I think it's important to laugh. I think it's important to smile, to laugh at ourselves. How many have made mistakes in the last five minutes? Yes, okay. We, we do, right? We, we mess up. And it's important to slow down and pay attention to the little things. So I'm excited to talk about some principles, so research-based, science-backed happy hacks that can improve your happiness, your positivity, and your productivity at work. Let me talk about the positivity pyramid. I'm a big believer in this. When I talk about parenting, I do parenting workshops. I talk about up at the top is correction. How many of you ever had to correct anyone that you're working with, right? Your administration is, ah, someone's fouled up. They say, okay, how much time do we spend on correction? As parents, we, we tend to spend a lot of time on correction. Regardless of the type of correction and how it's used, will always depend on prior teaching. We do a better job of teaching, we'll do less correction, hopefully, with some people. Beneath that is the relationship, regardless. So it could be teacher-child, it can be administrator and workers and staff. Regardless of what you put in that green level, the effectiveness of our teaching and our correction will always depend on your relationship. For example, everyone think about someone who just drives you crazy, that just bugs you, okay? Hopefully not at your table, but someone that just really irritates you. Now think about that person. Now let's say that person comes up to you and says, oh, Oh, Shelly, actually what you need to do here, sweetheart, is, and they try to correct you. And if you can't stand that person, what's your reaction? Yeah, 90% chance of an eye roll. You're like, oh my goodness, just leave me alone. And then you're going to do the opposite of where, whatever they just said, right? You're going to just to tick them off. 
So if you don't like somebody, the way they hold their fork can drive you crazy. But if you do like somebody, they can spill their entire lunch in your lap and you don't mind. Is that right? You say, oh, hi, that's okay, no problem. Underneath this is the key to what we're talking about today. And that is a positive, happy, flourishing person. How many of you love to hang around ornery, cranky, just critical, yeah, defensive? No, we don't like that. We like to hang around positive, happy people. And then we're more open to their teaching and correction when needed. So think about that principle, and I'll end with that principle as well, is this positivity pyramid. So what are some barriers to positivity? All kinds of barriers that get in the way, such as three-day conferences, right? They get in the way of our, of our positivity, where you're winding down, you're all kinds of things that are going crazy. Have, have you heard of HALT? Hungry, angry, lonely, tired. How many are experiencing all four of those right now? Right, right. Raise your hand. Okay, escort them out of the room, please. They have to get them a cookie or something, right? Hungry, angry, lonely, tired. When we're experiencing any of those, we're less likely to have access to the positive areas of our brain neuroscience is showing. So think about that. There's all kinds of distractions and things get in the way. One of those is comparison. How many of us suffer from comparison? As soon as we start scrolling, we're looking at other, other people and their happiness and the things that are going on in their life. It sucks the happiness out of us. So comparison is the thief of joy. Remember that. Remember that, that comparison will suck the joy right out of, your, out of your soul. Digital distractions, this term called technoference. Have you heard of that term, technoference? So recently I was on the news in, a, in Utah and several stations talking about a study that I did on techno, technoference. It's, it's when technology gets in the way of face-to-face -face relationships. That's what's happening. We see that a lot with parents and children. Do you see that in couple relationships? So I was recently speaking in San Diego. I took the SRAM fam on this one. Speaking in San Diego, and then after we, I get done speaking, we take them out to a Mexican restaurant, and we sit down, and we're having a great meal, and then I look over, and I see it. I see a father and son out there on their, you know, have a little date, and I think, oh, how great is that? And then dessert comes, and then this is what I see. Then for the next seven minutes, for the next seven minutes, there was no words exchanged between this father and this son. As the son ate his dessert all alone. And I thought, how sad. And then they got up and left. And who came and sat down in the very same table, the very same table. Notice the people in the background, the very same table, a couple comes and they sit down and they start doing, how, do we see this? Do we see that all the time? All the time this is current, this techno interference gets in the way in our relationships. So I just started two initiatives called K-Tube and K-Toot, kick technology out of beds and kick technology off of tables. How many of you would you agree with that? Yeah, I did a survey, 88% of Americans actually agree. I surveyed 621 parents, agree it's time to kick technology off of tables. No more work. Tables, these are two sacred spaces in my opinion. And so technology is showing the higher we're using that and all the social media, depression, anxiety, and all these other things are, are going up. So that's, well, that's one distraction that gets in the way. Previous, previous thinking on happiness was this. If we work really, really hard at our jobs, then we'll be successful, and then at the end of the day, then we can be happy. At the end of this conference, oh, right, especially this table, it's like, okay, yes, now I can be happy after all this work. But that is false. What we used to think was if I work really hard at my job or I work really hard as a parent or in my marriage, a couple relationship, then I'll be successful and then I'll be happy. But new research in neuroscience and positive psychology shows that it works the other way around. It says happiness and positive positivity first, and it fuels every other positive outcome. In relationships, at the job, education, workforce, all of this, when we're positive and happy first. That's when it spills over. So what contributes to happiness? What is happiness made of? Where does it come from? About half of our happiness we can blame on your parent or thank your parents for that happiness. We have this, this set point. And then where's, what about the rest? About 10% of our happiness is due to your circumstances, the job, where you're working right now, who you're even married to, or relationships, the kind of car that you drive, what kind of phone's in your pocket, those things only account for about 10%. Because we tend to get used to whatever we receive, right? Ladies, you get a new pair of shoes within 72 hours, that newness, that high, that dopamine is worn off, we come back down. You check into this hotel, right? You check in, you're like, oh, this is great. Wow, this is a wonderful place. By day three, you're like, this place is a dump. You know, this is, you're just, because we tend to get used to whatever it is that we have. 
in relationships, we call it the honeymoon effect, right? There's this honeymoon effect, and we're, we're happy and blissful, and then we all come down. We tend to get used to whatever there is going on in our lives. So I'm going to be talking about the 40%. The 40% is what we have more control over, and that is our thoughts and our actions, behaviors, those things that we get to control. I love that. I celebrate this 40% because that's what we're going to talk about today, things that you can do to increase the positivity and the happiness in your personal life, which then spills over into every other area of your life. So I love this research. 11 million pieces of information right now, as you're looking up here, 11 million pieces of information are passing through. Most of it is passing through our subconscious. But we can only focus on about 40 pieces, 40 bits of information. For example, I can guarantee no one in this room right now is thinking about your left big toe, right? Well, now you, now you are, now you are. But you weren't before, right? We call it attention. But our attention goes here, and it goes here, and it goes here. But we can only pay attention to one little piece, little 40 bits of information at a time. But what's wrong with that picture is that we are actually born with a negativity bias. That we are wired to focus on and look at the negative. In fact, we are born with five times as many neurons, brain cells, that are wired for negativity and threat for every one that is wired for positivity and opportunity. So already we're at a five to one deficit bias. And I can prove it. How I many of you have kiddos and they come home with their report card and they have five A's and a C minus? Where does your brain go? Where does your brain go? Automatically it goes to the C minus. We start lecturing about what happened? Weren't you going to talk to Mrs. Anderson after school? Get that paper turned in. And we start harping right on the C minus. We don't celebrate the A. We don't say, wow, you did so wonderful in that. We go right for the negative. In the work that we do, we look for, we're wired to notice, okay, what's wrong? What do I need to fix? So when you think about this 40 bits, there's a trade-off. There's a trade-off, and whoop, we're going the wrong way. There's a trade-off. The trade-off is, I think about negatives, my 40 bits are consumed with the negatives, then it means I can't see the positives going on around me because I can only focus on one thing at a time. Or I can change my mindset and choose to think about the positive and the good things. Of course, we have to be aware of the whole truth. We can't ignore the negative. But we're wired to see it, wired to notice it already. In fact, we're five times as I mentioned more likely to notice the negative and see mistakes. How many of you saw it? How many of you saw it? You, you're wired to see. You're wired to notice mistake. The green grass, there's a brown spot. What do you notice? Oh, honey, yeah, there's a brown spot out there. Hanging up your Christmas lights, and there's one bulb out. And you drive by that night. What do you notice? It's that one stinking bulb. You're like, oh, I'm never going to put up Christmas lights again. We're wired to focus on the negative things that are going on in our, on our lives. So everyone, hold out. This is one of my favorite, favorite studies. Everyone, hold out. Okay, do this 10 times as fast as you can. Yeah, finger curl. Finger curl study. Okay, all right. You can stop. That looks really weird. Okay. <laughs> so in this lab, in this lab, they have these volunteers, three groups of volunteers, and they come in. The first group comes in. They pull a lever, and it measures their finger strength. So they pull this lever as hard as they can, measures their finger strength, and then they're instructed for the next 12 weeks, 15 minutes a day, five days a week, to sit there and do this over and over. Yeah, don't volunteer for these studies. Like, honey, what are you doing? Ah, oh, doing my finger curls today. <laughs> it's like, okay. Yeah, don't do that. Don't do that. The second group, the second group, they come in, they pull the lever, it measures their initial finger strength, and they're, they're taken into another room, and they're actually told to sit down. Okay, now close your eyes and hold out your hand, and now just visualize finger curls. Now, that group is supposed to do that for 15 minutes a day for 12 weeks. Now, I don't know which one's worse, right? Honey, what are you doing? Oh, I'm visualizing my finger curls. <laughs> yeah, 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 that's weird. Honey, don't do that. Group three, they come in, they pull the lever, and they don't know about the study. They're sent home. 12 weeks later, 12 weeks later, they all come in. Time to pull the lever again to, to measure their finger strength. Group one, group one comes in, 53% increase in finger strength. What? Can you imagine walking around? Look at these sausages, man. Check out this. It's like, whoa. Did you see his fingers? They're so hot. They're like ripped. Yeah. It's twice the size of the other finger. Yeah. What happened to your finger? Oh, it's just, it's just finger curls, man. Finger curls. So what does that mean? Group three. Group three. They come in. They pull the lever. No increase. Not surprised. They didn't know about the study. Group two. This is the interesting one. These are the people who've been visualizing. They come in. Pull the lever. 35% increase in finger strength. What? What does that mean? That means 
you can forget your gym pass, and all you have to do is visualize exercise, right? It's like, yes. Dr. Dave, where have you been my whole life? Don't worry. I'm going to travel the nation and open up gyms with no equipment. Just come on in, man. Just walk out. Holy cow, yeah. No, when you go home, you should actually really practice this. So when you go home to your sweetheart, just stand against the wall until they ask, what are you doing? And then just say, I'm on mile 13 of a marathon, honey. Give me a water. Give me a water. Hurry, I'm dying over here. And see what they say. But what is it? Thinking about exercise activates the same area of the brain as real exercise. Now I get it. Some of you are like, Dr. Dave, I'll bet some of those in group two are doing a little bit of this action. So they did another study, this time with men's biceps. And this time they put them in a cast so they couldn't cheat, even if they wanted to cheat with a curling study. Now, again, guys, don't volunteer for this. Hey, oh, what happened to your arm? You're in a cast. Oh, nothing. I'm just in a study. Yeah, don't do that. Don't do that. They'll take your man card. Now, it wasn't 35% increase. It was 14.5% increase. Is that amazing? Because what typically happens, you put a, a body part, a limb in a cast, atrophy. But it didn't happen. They actually increased it with visualizing. So the power of the brain, the mind, is super duper powerful. And that's what we're talking about, because these are some things that you can do to actually rewire the brain for more positivity and productivity in your brain. So of all these, we're going to talk about this bottom one, these, about how important it is to have this flourishing aspect of your life. It helps everything else. 21 days, ha these happy hacks. Why 21 days? That's how long it takes to build up. That's what we hear all the time. And I decided, ah... I'm a nerdy professor. I'm going to see what really it is about 21 days. And it turns out it's 21 days because most of the cells in the human body are regenerating every 21 days. Isn't that interesting? So the skin, right? Skin flakes off. Your hair are growing. Everything is growing. The tongue is some of the fastest cells. The femur is some of the very slowest, the 21 days. So every 21 days, you're a completely different person at the cellular level, a different person. So when you start doing something, it actually becomes part of your cellular structure. Isn't that awesome? Yeah, you guys don't appreciate it as much as a nerdy professor does. I think that's pretty cool. So here they are. Journaling. How many of you keep a journal? Journaling. Good, good. The rest of you repent. Yeah, repent. <laughs> journaling. Why? What is it about journaling? This is the principle. The principle is this. We remember what we review. We remember what we rehearse. The more you talk about it, you're writing it down, it cements it in your brain longer. The same goes true with negative stuff. You're talking to the office, oh, you'll never believe what happened to me this weekend, and I got a flat tire. Oh, that's nothing. I got two flat tires. No. Talk about, write down the positive things. In one study, they even showed you didn't even need a journal. All you need is a napkin. They wrote it on a napkin, three positive things, what went well, and then they threw the napkin away, and they experienced the same increase in the happiness. Why? Because it's not necessarily keeping what you write down. It's the process of writing down the happy, good things that are going on in your life. Keeping track of those. Because we remember what we rehearse. So do that. Keep a journal. Log the good things that are going on in your lives. Gratitude is another happy hack. This is one of my favorites. So David Steiner Rost, this wonderful TED Talk, that he has given, speaking, so I'll be back here in seven weeks giving a TED Talk. Uh, I'm super, super pumped back in, in Eustace, back in Eustace, giving a TED Talk on, on happiness. He said this. He said, maybe as it comes up, there it is. In daily life, we must see that it is not happiness that makes us grateful, but gratefulness that makes us happy. I love that. And then he said this, gratefulness is the key to a happy life that we hold in our hands because if we're not grateful, then no matter how much we have, we will not be happy because we will always want to have something else or something more. Yeah, isn't that Instagram worthy? Talk about, that's powerful. Another professor that I had, I, I had, he said it this way. He said, you can never get enough of what you don't need because what you don't need will never satisfy you. You can never get enough of what you don't need because what you don't need will never satisfy you. Slowing down and being grateful for what we have in the moment, savoring that. In fact, the studies on this have exploded. It affects everything from suicidal thoughts to muscle aches and pains and improves mood and worry, anxiety, all of this from these gratitude journals, these gratitude hacks, writing things down. You know what I use? I actually use the 5-Minute Journal app. Anyone use the 5-Minute Journal app? I love it. 
I love it, I love it. Because it pops up 7 a.m., there's a little reminder. It says, let's start the day with gratitude. What three things are you grateful for? And it forces me to think of three different things and to be very specific about what I'm grateful for. Then at the end of the day, at 9 p.m., tonight there'll be a little reminder that comes up on my app and it'll say, what amazing things happened today? And then I get a journal of those. So this app helps knock out all of these. So gratitude, slowing down, being grateful. The five-minute journal app is one way to, to do that, especially if you're traveling a lot. Everybody, everybody take a look at your neighbor and big, big old cheesy smile. Big old smile. Okay, yeah, that one's fake. Yeah, that's your real smile. Your real smile. Yeah, you're, some of you are trying to fake it. Yeah. Your real smile. Yeah, see? I can see it. This is good. This is happiness. Like if we could measure the dopamine in the room right now, yeah, it's just, it's off the charts. Now I want you to implement this in your office space. I want you to implement the 10-5 way, the 10-5 rule. The 10-5 way is this. When you're within 10 feet of somebody in your office or down the hall, in the hotel, wherever you're at, you smile. When you're within five feet, you say hello. Hey, how you doing? Okay, you're going to do it. You're going to do it in the hotel. So when you get in the elevator... When you get in the elevator, don't you dare take out your phone and pretend like someone's texting you. We know you're not. Yeah, let's see. yeah. floor five, please. You do it just to avoid people. I know you. I just rode up the elevator with some of you. You know who you are. Smile. Smile. Look up and say hello to people. Smiling. But you know what smiling does? You know what smiling does? There's actually mirror neurons inside of our brain. So when you just turn to your neighbor and did that fake smile a minute ago, it turns on the mirror neurons and we tend to reflect that. So for example, I'm going to show you a picture and I'm going to see your, your response to this picture. It's universal. When I show you this, universal awe. It just automatically happens. Like, like I could go back, I could do it again like you've never seen it. Ah, oh. what? It just happens. It's a magical button. Why? As soon as you see that, these mirror neurons kick in. But, but not all smiles are created equal, right? Because if I show you this smile, for example, that doesn't quite, doesn't quite. See, it didn't quite evoke the ah that we had earlier. Something wrong there. Something a little different. Yeah, let's get it. That one's a little creepy. Let's get rid of that one. Okay, I want you to raise your hand in this room if you believe that you smile at least 20 times per day. Be honest. We're the smilers. Okay, yeah. The rest of you need to get your neighbor a cookie or a Happy Meal or something to make them smile. <laughs> research shows, research shows, only about one-third of us smile at least 20 times per day. 14% of us in this room smile less than five times per day. You know who you are. Yeah. Give them an elbow and be like, mm -mm, it's, it's you over here. That's right. Smiling. Smiling. How many times do children smile per day? Up to 400. 400 times per day. What is the number one killer of children's happiness? Parents and adults. You are. You are. It's you. If it wasn't for you, your kids would be so stinking happy. Yeah. <laughs> right? It's parents, it's adults. Yeah, we have the rules. 400 times per day. And the power of a smile, the power of one smile can release as much dopamine as up to 2,000 bars of chocolate. What? And you don't get all the calories. So now, now you're really going to be smiling when you're walking around and be like, yeah, I'm burning calories, yes. It's good for you, smiling and laughing, this happiness is contagious as well. And it turns on all the learning centers in the brain when we're happy. Oh man, exercise, diet, sleep. She's counting her steps right here, counting her steps, getting her steps in. I, and I'm speaking to the choir here. We know this, we know. There's been over 800 studies just in the last decade alone on sleep and the power of sleep and how important it is because sleep affects every other aspect of your life. And I can tell just by looking at some of you haven't been sleeping well right, in the last few days, have you? Yeah. It affects your digestive system, your metabolism, your immune system, every other system that's going on in our bodies. And when we don't get enough sleep, you know what we lose access to? We lose access 
to the positive areas of our brain. There's been studies that have shown that students who have looked at words, all these positive, negative, neutral words the night before, and some students, they manipulated it, right, and gave them five hours of sleep, they were less likely to remember the positive words. And they remembered 70% of the negative words. When you don't sleep well, yeah, remember, we're all cranky. There's a neuroscience behind that that shows when you don't sleep as much, you have less access to the positive things that are going on in your brain. Same with the way that we diet and the exercise, the moving, all of this releases these wonderful endorphins that help us to be happy, these happy hacks. Another one, how many of you started your day this morning like this? Alarm went off and you just, how many, where are the morning people? Raise your hand, I know you're out there, you evil little buggers. Yeah, there they are, yes. Those people, those people. The morning people, actually, it's great. One study showed, one study showed that if you start your day with as little as three minutes of negative news, right, just turn on the TV right now, that's all you get right now, three minutes of negative news, you are 26% more likely at the end of the day to rate your day as a bad day. What? With three minutes of negative news. So instead of starting that and looking at the news when you first wake up or scrolling your feed, start your day in a positive way. And that looks different for everybody. It could be meditation or yoga or exercise or prayer or something to get you going in a positive way. Because how it, does, it affects your entire day, how you start your day in a positive way. Discover and use your strengths. Here's a homework assignment. I want you to take this back. This is free, by the way. So this is free. Take it back to your, other, to your offices. Share this widely. So this is viacharacter.org. So Dr. Martin Seligman, the father of positive psychology did today, he developed these character strengths. And when you take this free survey, this will kick out your top five character strengths. Now, this is not singing and dancing and that kind of stuff. This is things like curiosity, humor, the ability to love and be loved, appreciation, kindness, gratitude. All of these are character strengths. It'll crank out your top five. And then I printed out mine, and I cut it out, and I taped it to the bottom of my computer screen at work. So literally, when I'm at work, I'm, I can focus on and remember my strengths. Because we're five times as likely to write, to remember the negative and all the other bad stuff that's going on, but when we are aware of our strengths and then go into your meetings, and ask someone about their strengths. What are, your, what are your top five? What are your character strengths? Talk about, use your character strengths. Talk about and use those. Flow, I love this concept of flow. Flow, this idea, it was developed by Mihai Csikszentmihalyi. Flow is this idea that when you immerse yourself in a task that stretches you, that takes all 40 bits of that, that, that concentration, all 40 bits are on this task. And we're immersed in that. It can happen at work. It can happen playing the piano or a puzzle or gardening or all kinds of things. How many of you have that? When you almost lose track of time because you're so invested, so involved in something that stretches you, that uses some of your strengths. This is a wonderful state, this flow state. It helps break some of the stress. Now, this isn't a stressful state. This is a state where it can be relaxing, but it does. It kind of, it kind of stretches us a little bit. So finding flow. What are those activities that you love to do, but kind of push you a little bit? That's what flow. That's flow. Meditation. Where are our meditators? Concentrator. Meditators. Yes. This mindfulness, and this has been around for thousands of years, but the research on this has exploded, showing that meditation can actually increase the thickness of the gray matter in your brain. You, you want thick gray matter. That's the area of, of focus and concentration and empathy and compassion. We want thick matter in our, the gray areas of our brain. So mindfulness. No wonder that Google has a chief officer of happiness. And they have these little hacks. Everyone take your hands off the keyboard for two minutes. Two minutes and then take some deep breaths. Closing your eyes, focus on your breath for two minutes. And they found that it increases productivity. So a small little hack. And it doesn't have to be, right? You don't have to start levitating with candles and around the room and things. Slow down. Just the little things. Just breathing. If you're not into meditation, just once in a while, take some deep breaths. And it will reset. It will reset you, especially when you're stressed. Stress, a lot of work's going on. All right. Now, this is a test. One of the things that mindfulness meditation does is help us to focus and concentrate. So, you, and you better be honest with me. How many of you, raise your hands, if you've been looking up at me during some part of my presentation, but your brain and your mind has wandered off to something else? 
Yes, good. Yep. The rest of you are liars. You're all liars. <laughs> My wife says, I got to stop calling people liars. You're not telling the truth out there. You're not telling. Why? Because our brains, about 47% of the time, when we're engaged in an activity, we're actually thinking about something other than what we're doing. And the study, the research on this shows it's pretty clear. And it ranges from this morning when you're taking a shower, ladies, getting your makeup on. How many of you were like, oh, yeah, this is looking really good today? Oh, yeah. Mm hmm, mm hmm. Yeah. 67% of the time, you're taking care of your body, yeah, your makeup, you're in the shower, you're, you're thinking about something else, which is okay, because a lot of that creativity stems there. What about some of these others? Commuting, driving to work, oh my goodness, how many of you ever ended up at work and you have no idea how you got there? You're like, <laughs> holy smokes, yeah, now think about the, the person next to you, they're not paying attention either, you guys come together, yeah, you're, <laughs> you're in trouble. That's 63% of the time when you're commuting, you're not thinking about what you're doing. Doing housework, working, working, I'm working, I'm working, you're not working. About half the time, you're thinking about something else that's on your mind. That's a lot of time, actually, at work. What about shopping, taking care of your kids? How many of you have kiddos, and they came up to you recently, and they're like, Mom, Mom, Dad, Dad, guess what happened? And they share what happened, and you say, oh, that's so great, honey. And you have no idea what they just said, do you? <laughs> guilty, 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 guilty. Guilty, yes, guilty. Guilty. Our minds are wandering. They're busy, aren't they? What about reading, eating, exercising, talking? How many of you just at this conference, someone's been talking with you and you're like, oh, yeah? Your, your mind, you weren't even listening, were you? <laughs> yeah, I know it. I know it. It happens all the time. It happens at least, what, 32% of the time? That last one, that last, don't ask your sweetheart about that one. I asked my wife and she's like, what's that, honey? And I was like, oh, man. <laughs> Her mind was somewhere else. Mind was somewhere else. So that happens all the time. This is one of my favorites of all the happy hacks. Random acts of kindness. I call it racks. Random acts of kindness. If you want to be happy, like instantly, instantly, random acts of kindness. In fact, Martin Seligman, he said, doing a kind act produces the single most reliable momentary increase in well-being of any of the hacks that they've tested. Of all the ones that I'm talking about today, this one will increase the happiness faster than anything. Do something kind for someone else. I call it turning outward. Search inward, know your strengths, turn outward to others. I talk about look upward and press forward. Those, in my mind, are eight words that will lead to happiness. Search inward, turn out. This one's about turning out random acts of kindness. In fact, I had a good buddy, Ryan Hatcher, who is always looking for, he just finished up a food drive down in Arizona. And he posted this on Facebook not too long ago. How many of you even knew that Crossing Guard Appreciation Day was a thing? I did not. I did not. But he'll find it. Yeah. And he found out. And he took his kids. He takes them to the store. And he, hey, let's get some things. Let's put them together. I took them out to the crossing guards. Now, who does that affect? It affects his kids. It affects him. It affects anyone that witnessed it that day. It affects the crossing guard. And then me, because I saw it. And now you, because now you saw it. You see what happens with an act of kindness? You do something kind for your staff. You find out their love language. You write them a note. You send them a personalized text. You put it on their computer screen. Do something kind. That will build the unity in your offices faster than anything as gratitude and kindness. In fact, 81% of respondents in one survey said that they would work harder for a grateful boss. 35% report never being thanked by a manager. Isn't that sad? Remember, think to thank. Remember. Be kind. Express kindness and gratitude and share that with other people. That will give you a boost in happiness. All right, so what predicts staying alive? Staying alive in this life. There are some factors, in fact, some meta-analyses. So these are studies of studies. So hundreds of studies have been put together. Here are some of the top ones. Now you look at the clean air. Clean air, not a strong predictor. Unless you live, right, in one of these smoggy cities. Hypertension treatment. Lean versus overweight? Yeah, forget about that diet, man. It has no clue. No, it is. It's, it's, it's still important. Exercise, except for what do we learn about exercise? It's all in your head, man. It's all in your head. Just visualize it. Yeah, sell the elliptical. You don't use it anyway. You know you don't. It's all here. No, real exercise really is good for you. What about this? Cardiac rehab. The flu, oh, flu season. How many of you got your flu shot? Okay, the rest of you are not going to be here in four years. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, that's awful. 
Get your flu shot. It tends to be actually a pretty, pretty strong predator. Quitting drinking. Interesting. Quitting drinking, quitting smoking. All right, what are the, the top two? The top two predictors, how long and how well you're going to live in this life, the power of your close relationships is number two. What is number one? What is number one? It turns out number one is quitting Fortnite is actually the top predictor of how long you're going <laughs> to no, take your picture with, with that one really quick and you can send it to your child and be like, see, see this is the scholar you're talking about? No, it is actually, yeah, get rid of that one. It's actually this. What's happening right here today, social integration, what happens at the office, because who do you spend a lot, a big one-third of your adult lives with? These people at your table, unfortunately. No, fortunately. <laughs> it's this. It's these people, social integration. It's who you see at the grocery store. It's who you interact with at conferences, in the office. Close relationships, that's talking about family. But those two combined, family and friends and coworkers, when those relationships are great, it affects your immune system. Right? It affects all of this, all these areas that we're talking about, social integration and your close relationships. So do those things. Work on those things. Acts of kindness, gratitude, all of that will help. In fact, wonderful TED Talk by Robert Waldinger. He says this, the clearest message that we get from the 75-year study is this. Good relationships keep us happier and healthier, period. People who are more socially connected to family, to friends, to community are happier. They're physically healthier and they live longer than people who are less well-connected. And good relationships don't just protect our bodies. They protect our brains, the power of good, healthy relationships. Invest in those. One of the greatest investments you can make in this life is in your relationships, those people. And what happens sometimes in relationships? Oh, miscommunication happens, and we offend people. Things happen, and then we start feeling this animosity, and it becomes uncomfortable with people. Another one of the happy hacks is dropping the grudge, learning to forgive. Because that animosity, and you've heard this, it's like drinking poison and expecting my enemy to die. But what it does is it cankers the soul is what it does when we're unable to let things go and move past it. I love this quote by Nelson Mandel. He said it this way, as I walked out the door toward the gate that would lead to my freedom, I knew if I didn't leave my bitterness and hatred behind, I'd still be in prison. Learning to forgive. And this is not just a religious forgiveness. The last decade has, sh has shown hundreds of studies on the power of forgiveness in couple relationships, in coworkers, in parent-child relationships, you name it. And the studies are showing that dropping grudges leads to happier. You're more free because forgiveness is really for you. It's to relieve that burden off of you in addition to the other person. But it's for you. So here are some, people say, Dr. Dave, what book do you recommend? What do you think some of the best things out there? So here are some of my, I call them Dave's faves. Here are my favorites. You're going to do a book club. You're going to get a gift to somebody in the office. If you want to read a book together, I would start with one of these. These are my faves. Now, my favorite one on depression is, and I added it down at the bottom, The Upward Spiral by Alex Korb. He's a wonderful uh, neuroscientist, UCLA. And that book is amazing. It has all of these happy hacks you can do that actually have been shown to increase not only the happiness, but decrease depression and anxiety. And it's an easy read. It's, a, it's not a big old thick, complicated book. It's a very simple, easy, fun read. It's a really good one. Blinkist. Blinkist is one of my favorite apps. So Blinkist takes over 4,000 books in 27 areas, including these parenting and happiness areas, leadership, and it boils it down to 15 minutes. 15 minutes. So I've listened to over 202 books, because I just listened to two more on the plane from Dallas over here. It's the 15-minute version. If I like the 15-minute version, then I buy the book and I read it. I love that. It summarizes the best parts of the book for you. So what about some apps and websites and podcasts and things? These, these are some favorite. These are just a handful, because now there are hundreds of these. So finding things. We can use technology for good. We can use it for meditation, to slow down, to listen to podcasts, to listen to the best minds out there, the scholars that are talking about these things. We can listen to them. We can learn. Never stop learning and growing. Be curious. Be anxiously engaged in learning and developing and, and improving your happiness. So those are some that you may, you may want to check out. Lots more, all kinds of those. 
the overall theme, right? People like happy people. People do. When you're smiling at each other, you're more likely, right? You're happy. When you see a happy person, you're more likely to be happy. So let me leave you with some motivating words. Some of the best advice I've ever received is from my eight-year-old daughter. How many of you have had that night when you can't get your children to bed fast enough? Be honest. You're just like, okay, I've had it. I'm done with today. Stay in your bed, right? So you have dinner, and then you do tubby time, and you're brushing teeth, and let's read books, and then, okay, now you get a drink. Now stay in your beds, and they keep coming out, and then you start bargaining, and then you start threatening, right? And they're like, ah, oh, $20 bill for anyone who stays in their bed, right? Please just stay in your beds. And then I remember even threatening, I'm going to sell you on eBay if you guys keep coming out of your room. <laughs> no, don't make me do it. No, I'm going to hit the hit. No, and then I walk back to my room, frustrated. Oh, I'm frustrated with myself. Less than five minutes later, what do I hear? Come right toward my door, and I know what's happening, and I'm waiting for it. Wait for it. And then I hear a child's hand on my door, and that's when I bark, get back to your room. And I hear, <laughs> racing down the hall, and I go to the door. I open the door, and there's a note. There's a note taped to the door by my eight-year-old daughter. And this is a picture of the actual note. This daughter is now a freshman at Utah State University. This is when she was eight. Now she's 18. And she said this. She said, thanks a lot. I know it can be hard being a mom or dad, but you got to stick with it. <laughs> yeah, oh, my gosh. <laughs> Dang, oh. <laughs> wow. Yeah, that was my reaction. I thought, oh, wow, what have I done? Here's Dr. Dave. Do we blow it? Do we blow it? Like, this is our area. Do you ever blow it with your kids or lose it with a coworker? Yeah, 10 years, 10 years of school. And I, Dr. Day, I still blow it. And I still lose it. But do you notice what she says on the side? It says, look on back. So I turn that note over, and that note says, don't worry, we still love you. I think, oh. And that's my message. We're going to make mistakes. We're going to blow it. We're going to lose it. But we stick with it. We stick with it because we implement these happy hacks. Now, don't try all of these, but try one of these. Try it for 21 days. Try it for two days. Do something kind. And here's one. Here's a challenge. Try doing this this coming week. Here's my challenge. I call it text two before 10. Text two people before 10 a.m. for the next week. A random text of kindness, of gratitude, of love. It could be a former high school teacher, gym coach, religious leader, a parent, an in-law, text two before 10. Try it. Try it and watch and see what happens. It strengthens relationships. It mends fences. And it strengthens and builds happiness. Thank you.